Thank you very much, Kirsten, and uh, for that lovely introduction, and welcome all my physio friends and um, prosthetists, engineers, and others that, and physicians that share uh, in this meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank the ISPO uh, organizing committee for inviting me here. It's uh, an honor. This is a meeting that I have looked forward to uh, each time it comes around in my career, and to have the opportunity to address you as a keynote is certainly a privilege and an honor. So with that, um, I should probably give a disclaimer. Nothing that I'm speaking about do I have any financial interest. In addition, I need to make you aware that I am an American and that we do lead the world in research production. Three times that of, of uh, most other countries or all other countries. Um, however, we also lead the world in 300% higher cost for healthcare. So the same thing that you can buy anywhere else in the world, you can come to the United States and sell it for three times that amount of money. Then with all that cost, that ranks us about 37th in the world in terms of healthcare provision to the folks that are there. So it may cost us a lot more, but we don't get as much as what others do. In fact, with all that cost, we also rank 31st in life expectancy in the United States. And it's not just because we lead the world with guns either. And then, we, when we look at comparative effectiveness, which is what I hope to speak to or will be speaking to you about today, is that we were one of the last countries to adopt comparative effectiveness research. So I have to ask you, although in my heart and in the hearts of all Americans, we are still number one in everything in our own minds, why the heck am I the one speaking about outcomes and comparative effectiveness research? To kind of put it more distinctly, is that these are all the countries that we went to uh, and to learn about comparative effectiveness research. And as you can see, it's pretty much, and then on the, uh, the other side of the chart, you can also see, as I was talking about with the World Health Organization, where we rank in terms of healthcare and expenditure per capita. And it's pretty much like the World Cup. We think we're really good, but when we go out there, all these countries countries kick our butts. So what I want to talk about is outcomes. And outcomes is pretty simple, is we kind of have these convoluted definitions, but it's the way things turn out. It's a consequence. It's a conclusion reached through a process of logical thinking. And that's simply what any outcome is, regardless if we use some type of a test or some kind of survey. Now, comparative effectiveness research, however, is composed of measures that are useful in determining the value of a treatment and their options. And later on, it becomes defined a couple of years later by Greenfield, where he says comparative effectiveness research is a direct comparison of existing healthcare interventions. That of what we do, whether it's providing a prosthesis, a surgery, or doing the therapy to determine which works best with our patients, and, or which patients, and which poses the greatest benefits and harm. And we have to look at both of those. So what the world is asking is that they want quality. And now we see this even more and more with uh, the use of different analytics where almost everybody can go on Google and, and do various comparisons. And so um, in today's healthcare or today's world, they give you an advertisement where you promise this, but you open up the bag and you get this. Is you see the commercial and you see this, but you end up with that. And as a result, people are upset because they're not getting what they are promised. So they want to know which is better and which is worse. So as a result, when we look at prosthetics, we look at surgeries. And what's the difference between doing a posterior flap, a lateral skew, doing a myocutaneous flap, or doing osseous integration? We don't know. We don't have all the evidence that's out there. Even when it comes to therapy, we don't know which therapy measures are better. We don't have that preponderance of information. Now we get the prosthetics. Which is the best socket? All you have to do is talk to the nearest prosthetist, and he'll tell you he has the best socket. You go to the next one, 
He has the best socket. It's the same thing with therapists, by the way. We all believe that we do the best treatments. But the same thing comes with knees and feet and so on. So the idea is we have this hierarchy, this pyramid of level of evidence in which um, we all know is that we look at these randomized controlled trials. And that's when in the, in the uh, universities, that's the standard that we're held to. We need to have uh, two groups. And the old days where in prosthetics we used to have expert opinion. We get a group of folks into a room and we would all decide that I think this is the best because this is what we've been doing for all those years. No longer holds true. And everybody wants to see, especially the payers, randomized controlled trials, or at least they used to. But leave it to the British, because in um, the British Journal of Medicine in 2003, an article was published, and it was talking about the relationships of looking at randomized controlled trials. And the idea was, does the parachute prevent death and major trauma? So what the study proposed was to take two groups. It's to take one group, the intervention group, a group of folks with an actual parachute to jump out of an airplane. The second would be the control, a group that just jumped out of the airplane, and would we be able to determine if the parachute was effective? Now, obviously, this is why we have IRBs, so the study was never done, but it goes to illustrate that we can't always measure things through randomized controlled trials. It doesn't work. So as things move forward, as we started to look at comparative effectiveness research and realized that we had to introduce different models. And this actually comes out of uh, Dartmouth and research that was done looking at uh, cancer research and then it's gone on to other areas such as heart disease and what have you. But in the model, you have your comparative effectiveness research. But there's the clinical trials, which are the randomized controlled trials and cohort studies in which that information can be provided to the health services uh, so that they can make determination for research. And then you can also have the clinical trials. Now, they realize is that that's very costly. It takes years to complete a research project. And there's thousands, if not millions, of people who are receiving these treatments. So with comparative effectiveness research, began to look at how do we use observational studies. That means is that what we see in the clinic actually counts. In fact, they took it a little bit further where they looked at claims data. Those bills that we send to the parties, the, the paying parties, whether or not it be government or private insurance, they want to look at that data. And then finally, we're seeing this idea of registry data. And we see this in the United States, but we're also seeing it worldwide, is the idea of everybody who's in practice, whether you're in a hospital, whether or not you're in a, a private practice, sharing information in one collective repository so that we can access that data to see where the differences lie. Where's the value? Where's the harm? And as we do that, we can begin to demonstrate the value of our interventions, whether or not it be surgery, therapy, or providing a prosthesis. So this is the new model that's being proposed around the world. Now in prosthetics, even though there is surgery and even though there is therapy, we tend to be very device-driven. We want to know what's the difference between these two sockets. Sometimes that's really difficult to determine. And we also get caught up with what's in the pressures inside, inside the socket, what's occurring, is there motion taking place, and what have you. What's the difference between two knees? Is, is this knee better than the other knee, and why? And although we don't have a whole lot of data supporting that, oftentimes when you talk to manufacturers, you know, it has better stance control, it adapts to your swing a little bit better, and most importantly, we have changed the color of this knee. It's no longer blue, it's now gray, soon to be black. And so then we also look at feet. And so what's the difference between feet? And we have this information. We know inherently that there's difference between feet. And we have data that shows that older types of feet, like the satch foot, actually can do more harm to a person who's a robust walker because of the loads that are placed on the foot and what have you. But we don't have these large studies that are starting to demonstrate that value in the greater population, we have a few studies, usually a very small end, in which we'll 
demonstrate the differences with a small group that was done, uh, which was tested with inside a laboratory. So we don't know the far-reaching differences. Now, what's occurring in the United States, as well around the world, is how, who and how do we pay for all these types of things? And, and typically, that goes to the payers. And so the payers, at the end of the day, control a lot of what we do in making clinic, clinical decision making. So if we look at historically, and historically only goes back to 2013, and this is among all hospitals in the United States, but by the way, this model was taken from a global model, so it's just not in the United States. When we look at this idea of value-based purchasing, what they will pay for, initially what they're looking at was clinical process. What type of surgery, what type of therapy, what type of components a person used, and then second was patient experience because it's important to them as a hospital is that the patient have a satisfying pay, uh, experience, just like it is when they come to our clinic, because they, they go out to tell everyone, oh, I went there, they were wonderful, right from the beginning, the receptionist met me, they were very professional, I got a good device, I was able to do all the things I wanted to do. I, you know, all of these things are important because the hospital wants them to come back to see them. But then you go to 2014. Well, now this whole idea of clinical process shrinks dramatically to 45%. We see it's still patient satisfaction at 30%, but now we have outcomes. And at this point, now they want measurable differences to be determined between the, the folks that we treat or their patients. So they're asking for what are the outcomes and what occurs by whatever intervention received at the hospital. Fast forward a whole nother year, and now this idea of clinical process, what we do, shrinks to 20%, outcomes increases a little bit to 30%, and now they want to know the efficiency. How quickly can you get somebody in and out of a hospital? In fact, they're changing models where if you get somebody out of the hospital too quickly, then that ho and the hospital didn't provide the care, then that person is readmitted to the hospital, the hospital has to pay the entire bill. Now this is working in some ways because they leave people in emergency rooms for a long time and don't admit them to the hospital so they don't have to pay for it. However, what they're looking for is which providers can get somebody into the system, treat them appropriately, make them well, and do it in an efficient and timely manner so the patient isn't taking forever to receive the treatment that they need to receive. Now, 2016, all of a sudden, clinical process shrinks down to 10%, 40% with outcomes, and we see that the patient experience is still at 25%, and now we're seeing efficiency at 25%. So this is the model that folks are looking for. So what are the specifics? They want to know which diagnoses can you treat effectively. So this is the important information. What's the difference between a transtibular amputee, a transfemoral amputee, a bilateral amputee, or a person receiving orthotics? Because again, although I am prosthetic driven and amputee care driven, all of this applies to orthotics as well. But which diagnosis do you treat most effectively? The next that has raised its, its head in the system is the complexity. And by complexity, it doesn't mean, oh, this person is a difficult fit because they're a very short transfemoral amputee. Is this per does this person have diabetes? Does this person have heart disease? Does this person have visual impairment? Does this person have renal issues that have to be dealt with? Are there issues with the other foot? All of the comorbidities and secondary diagnoses that this person presents with becomes important. And what they want to know is which providers can take care of those complex patients the best in an efficient manner. Because they want to know the number of visits. How many folks in here know how many visits it takes in order to treat somebody that comes in and cares for them, so, or the patients that we care for? We need to know how many visits, and it's not that you want to treat somebody in the shortest number of visits, but is what is the appropriate number of visits for a complex patient versus a patient that may not have so much complexity. Excuse me. The next is the outcomes. And it's not just that one outcome. It's the long-term outcomes. 
What is the outcome a year from now? Is the person still walking? Is the person still going to work? Is this person still caring for their family? What is the five-year outcome? And that's something that often eludes us. And then finally, patient satisfaction. They are selling a product just as we are selling a product. We sell a product of therapy, of surgical care, and also on prosthetics. But at the same time, what they would like to know is that if we put all of this together, Whoops, wrong printer, uh, button. Anyway, what is the reduction of healthcare costs? Because at the end of the day, again, I live in a country that we pay three times as much for the same healthcare. We need to get those dollars down. Now, they want it out of everybody's pocket, but out of the administration, but that's another story for another time. So the models have changed. So then we used to pay for volume and um, there were no quality measures required. It was fee for service. Come in, I take care of you, I send the bill, I get paid. Now it's value-based payment. So there's some quality checks that are taking place and the process needs to be improved. But in the future, it's looking at quality outcomes, but it's looking at the whole system. So in other words, is that if you're a prosthetist or you're a therapist and somebody comes to your office, it's not incumbent upon you just to treat that person with providing a prosthesis or just giving them exercise. But if that person has psychosocial issues, have you referred them to a psychologist? If the person comes in and expresses to you that they're experiencing back pain, do you say, oh, gee whiz, that's just too bad. Uh, take a couple aspirin and I hope it feels better. You need to refer them to the orthopedist or the specialist in order to look at the back. If you notice is that that person has had an ulcer, are you working with the endocrinologist, with the wound care therapist? Are you part of the bigger process? Because they're looking at that. How do we accept a referral and how do we do reverse referrals or do we do collective referrals in order to begin to be part of the process. We are not islands. We cannot exist in isolation. So it comes down to outcomes. And so we hear this, and this has been a major uh, topic uh, throughout this meeting as it has been in Lyon, and we know that it's important. And everybody has their different outcomes in medicine. The orthopedist will have the x-ray and puts a lot of hardware. Vascular surgeons will have imaging that they can look to see what's happening. We have lab tests, DEXA scans. Um, we uh, have all kinds of uh, uh, vital measures that we can take. And we can also uh, use gate lab uh, types of, of measures. But there are more areas of concern when we look at the total patient. The things that we have to look at is, do they have a sedentary lifestyle? And can we improve their mobility so that they don't have secondary disabilities because they're sitting at home and, and uh, increasing their BMI, is having uh, uh, developing heart disease in our country, as many others, and developing diabetes. Can we get them back into the workplace? That is important to a lot of these folks is because it helps society, is that if a person is dependent on the paying system from the society, that's expensive. If they become part of the workforce and they're paying taxes, that's beneficial. What about low back pain? Is that we, and we'll talk about it in a bit, but a number of our folks have low back pain into the healthcare world. That is a huge expense. Can we reduce back pain? Can we reduce secondary conditions such as osteoarthritis of the knee or of the, the hip? One of the biggest ones, secondary only to, in, in our country, to heart disease is falls. It was that they know is that a person over the age of 70 who has a fall most likely will have to go to uh, a, a home living, uh, not a home living facility, an extended or nursing home living facility, and they're not going to be able to return to their home. That's a great expense. Adverse events to the contralateral limb. Do we ever talk about this? We talk about, oh, you have greater stability with this prosthetic device. You're able to go down ramps uh, in a more controlled manner. But what does that turn into in terms of health care? Does it reduce the forces coming down on the contralateral limb that will cause an ulcer to that foot, which will cause that person to be at risk of losing that foot or have to go through three months of care to heal that ulcer? Does it uh, change the 
person's vitals, their BMI, their blood pressure, the diabetes, all of these things that that turns into dollars, whether it's a government paying agency or a private paying agency. And then finally, it's going to be patient satisfaction and it's going to be dealing with complex patients. So as we start to look at all of these issues together, is that what did you want to measure? Because we didn't really talk about the prosthesis. Well, you want to know what's the time to fabricate a prosthesis because that's going to add to your bottom line. If you're taking complex patients and you're trying to bill at the same level as somebody that is a non-complex patient, is that that time for fabrication, you need to understand that so you can talk to the insurance companies to say, yes, I can treat these patients with complexity, but there are additional charges. It's not just the device. Is that what are the total costs as all of, you know, plastic, it used to be simple, plaster and plastic, and the person was pretty much taken care of with a few components. Now we're talking about carbon fibers, we're talking about different silicones, it's getting more and more expensive. Then, do you talk about the cost to return ratio? What's the, your cost to get this person back into the workforce to decrease the overall cost? What's the cost to reduce the societal burden because the person is on some type of welfare or uh, state care? And then um, through that, also, what is the, the cost to healthcare burden? If I take care of this person with more sophisticated prostheses, am I going to reduce osteoarthritis, risk of injury to the other foot if the person is diabetic? Then you want to know what is the patient satisfaction with your patients? Because if they're not happy with you, there are other alternatives in your community, I'm betting, that they can go see that person. What about their mobility? They're happy if they're mobile. They're mobile, they're getting out, and they're telling other people what you did for them. And then the reduction of falls is that can we demonstrate is that through our therapy and strengthening the person, through the ability to provide the right prosthetic device, we can reduce falls. Can we reduce secondary conditions as we just talked about before? Can we improve the person's quality of life? And can we change that long-term disability? So, well, this is becoming a favorite cartoon and one that we've seen quite a bit. And we have the professor here saying for a fair and a selection, everybody has to take the same exam. So please climb that tree. So monkey's very ecstatic. The elephant, although he's part of the big five, has no idea how he's getting up that tree. So what's the relevance of this? Every time we talk about outcomes, I'll have somebody come up and say, you know, I'm very, very busy. And I get it, I know, I know I need to do outcomes. What's the one test that I can do to provide outcomes? It's not one test. It's definitely not one test. There's three different types of ways that you can measure. You can look at self-report. The patient's going to tell you how well they're doing. Now, most people think that's inaccurate. It's actually the second most accurate. There is the professional report. You, because you've seen this person for a whole three hours, feel that you know exactly what they need. So a professional report seems to be the better one, but it's the weakest. And then there's performance-based measures. You want to know how well they're doing? Ask them to do what you want them to do, and then you can grade them on how well they're doing. So which one do we use? Well, unfortunately, you're going to have to make that decision because you have to decide what is the best outcome measure for your practice or what you're trying to investigate. Now, it's really simple. Here's a partial list of all the outcome measures that you have to select from. Now, this is why you come to this meeting, because there guarantees somewhere around this facility throughout the day, people are going to be talking about different outcome measures and what they measure, because there's a lot of really good scientists that are working to help improve outcomes, because the outcomes we developed in the 80s and the 90s are not as sophisticated as the ones that have been developed recently. But at the same time, let me use an example of how we can use outcomes and how we look at them. So if we take something very simple as looking at osteoarthritis, is we know that in uh, the amputee population, and to summarize the, all the articles that are out there, 20% of us, non-amputee population, if you don't wear prostheses, um, is gonna have some type of knee OA. If you're transtibial amputee, it jumps to 40%, and somewhere around 60% for transfemoral amputees. 
if looking at the hip, the hip is going to uh, uh, have on the sound side, and I'm talking about, is going to be somewhere between uh, 30 and 40 percent, depending on the level. So we know that it's prevalent within this, country, uh, within this uh, group. So now we have to turn to our toolbox. If you want to demonstrate the value of what you're going to do in terms of reducing the, um, the effects of osteoarthritis, then you can look at, well, which outcomes am I going to choose from? Well, we put that under health. And so we have these different outcomes that would look at the WOMAC, which is a measure of osteoarthritis. So that's a health outcome. Now, you may want to look at socket fit. You may want to look at function and satisfaction, mobility, balance, functional mobility. Um, we have all kinds of mobility and then fall risk. So the WOMAC asks questions that we really care about in terms of uh, osteoarthritis. Is zero means that a person has uh, none of the effects and for extreme uh, effects. So we look at pain when they're walking, going up and down stairs, nocturnal, that looks at stiffness, and then it looks at function in terms of looking at stairs, sitting, shopping, the various activities. So how do different professions use these outcome measures? So if you have a patient with degenerative joint disease, the doctor is going to talk to the person, they say, I have pain and limited mobility. He will use the WOMAC. It's one of the most widely used um, test since the 1980s for looking at degenerative joint disease. He'll also do an x-ray and say, hmm, he's not looking so good. What would the CPO do? Well, if you had a patient with a transtibial amputation, degenerative joint disease, they have pain and limited mobility. He could use the WOMAC and maybe the plus M or the prosthetic limb user survey in order to look at pain and mobility. The physician is going to do an intervention. They'll do a total knee replacement. The prosthetist, their intervention, they're going to give them a prosthetic device and maybe an unloader type brace on the contralateral limb to reduce the pain. What's the results? Pain-free mobility for the physician, and he demonstrated by redoing the tests and the x-rays, and sounds loud. And then our woman right here, she's walking and she's walking uh, without pain. Yeah, maybe she has to use a cane, but she's back into the community. What's the difference with the prosthesis is that the person has reduced pain. They're back out playing golf. So it's a great outfit, effect. So now we look at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. In their repository, they have almost three-quarter of a million people with degenerative joint disease, and they found that they, 90% of the time, with their procedure of a total joint replacement, they reduced their pain, and 95% of the folks were satisfied, they returned to work, they returned to their previous position at the office, the, uh, the implant lasted 90, uh, 10 years in 90% of the cases, 20 years in 80% of the cases, and they had a few uh, complications. Complications are important to talk about. When they look at what the outcomes were, the SF36 um, and the WOMAC, is that they can show that there was increase in function and movement and release of pain, but stiffness didn't change. That's okay, but they have huge amounts of data. When we look in the prosthetic world, is that if we did the plus M or we did some other kind of mobility measures like the two-minute walk test and the WOMAC, we have, oh, nothing. We don't have any ability to show the value of what we did. But let's talk about back pain, because we know with back pain, since the early work of Don Ede and then Doug Smith, who were collaborating together, and then Kilcarney, is about 60% of our people who wear a prosthesis are going to have back pain within two years. And so the Oswestry is that uh, was designed by Fairbanks in the 80s. It's used around the world. It's one of the best at work look at amputees. They even have a criteria. If your score is 0 to 20%, you're minimally disabled. And it goes up to 40 60% for severely disabled. And this is, oh, I love the British with their terms. If you're 60 to 80%, you're crippled. And so, and that is actually a defined term. And when you put that in your notes in the United States, you say they have crippling back pain. That gets the attention of the payers. So what does the physician do? They have low back, they have a nerve root problem, they put, go on MRI, they identify it, they give them the Oswestry, 65%, they're crippled with transfemoral amputee with low back pain. Most of our uh, transfemoral amputees have it. If we give them the Oswestry, we look at their posture. When this uh, 
six-minute walk test, we decide that they don't have a lot of movement. The intervention for the physician? Surgery. The intervention for the uh, prosthetist? A well-fitting socket, the right knee with stability, the right foot. What's the result? Decreased pain, increased mobility. This little old lady has everything, bad knees, bad uh, back. She's back out doing what she needs to do. Pain and decreased pain and result uh, for the prosthetist, the guy's out walking, doing the other things he wants to do. If we look at studies that have been done over five years, baseline, six weeks, one year, five year, we see that there's a decrease using the oswestry and other pain measures in the back and the leg, and it continues significantly over five years. When we look at the prosthetic world, oh, and then also we can look at the SF36 again in another study, and you look at six weeks, one year, five years, it's decreased, the surgery has worked. When we look in the prosthetic world, we could do those same tools and we could look at mobility and again, look at their health with using the oswestry as well as what the difference in the fit of the socket was and using maybe the tapes to look at what their satisfaction is and what their psychosocial changes have taken place. But we don't have that information. That's what the other professions are doing to demonstrate the value. We know when somebody comes in and she's got all her weight on the sound limb, she shifts her weight over to this side and it looks like it's equal. But if we did an objective measure and we put weight equally bearing through both limbs, she sinks down into the socket, she's now at a, the, an obliquity at the SI joint. She's complaining of SI joint pain. This happens at, at half a dozen times a year. We come in, we raise the prosthesis, we reflex uh, the socket, we get her comfortable. We changed her pain and they move on the os westry score by simple little things about looking at posture and looking at alignment. But do we get credit for it? I just put in the nose, hey, came in, took care of her, it's pain free. But I don't do that. I also have the os westry and I can demonstrate. I can demonstrate that I've altered their biomechanics through gay training because that we know is that altered biomechanics is going to cause more stress and strain to the lower limb and to the back. We can also look at the differences in the musculature. When we have somebody walking like this, and we can get symmetry of gait and have them stop overextending with the prosthesis and do all the things we may have talked about yesterday and all the things we're learning about here, we can make that person better. But can we document it? So what's the difference between surgical and uh, care? Well, it's a replacement of a joint. It decreases the person's pain. It increases the person's function. It improves their overall quality of life, and it reduces the cost of, of overall care to that person throughout time. Well, let's talk about prosthetics. Well, we replaced the entire limb. We then decreased joint pain. We decreased our improved function. We improved the person's quality of life, and we have a reduction of cost. Who's the winner here? Well, physiotherapists, because we treat both populations. However, is that you look at the two. And what is the difference between these medical appliances or medical devices? Nothing. Prosthetics is not a replacement of a limb. It is a medical appliance that can improve a person's quality of life, decrease the amount of pain, and allow that person to function a little bit better. But here's the problem, is that when something is brought into the medical community, a device of some sort, in the United States it goes through FDA testing. And so our federal government looks at the device. So you have to have the uh, discovery or the idea, you then put together the prototype, you then do preclinical trials, you do clinical trials, and then it goes through regulatory decision making because the clinical trials demonstrate the benefit or the value of that device. So then when the physician or the surgeon goes and say this total knee replacement or this implement for the back is going to make a difference with my patient, is that they have the data to say in 80% of these folks that use this in the first clinical trials, they had benefit. They can't say 100%, but that's good enough. They will reimburse them. Unfortunately, with prosthetics, if you have a good idea and you put it through ISO testing and it doesn't break under X number of million uh, revolutions and we have the catastrophic failure, then all we can say is it won't break. 
So we don't have those clinical trials. We can get something to market faster because we don't have to go through this multi-year process, but we on the back end don't collect the data to demonstrate the value of that device. That's why we need the toolbox to look at health, fit of the socket, satisfaction, mobility, balance, and those types of things. And we, it, it, it's unfathomable to me that the socket fit comfort score that was developed by Hans Volt back in 2003 isn't used universally. Somebody comes in, it's because their prosthesis usually hurts and it's the socket. So you fix the socket, you move them from a four to a nine on the comfort scale, and you made a significant difference. That should be in the notes. We should be jumping from the top of the mountain talking about this to the insurance companies. In fact, if you, this afternoon, uh, my associate, uh, Anat Crystal, will be talking about the, um, the comprehensive amputee socket survey, which we developed because we think a socket is more than comfort. It's looking at stability. It's looking at suspension. It's looking at comfort and its appearance for that individual. And then it's not just in standing. It's in sitting. It is in standing, walking, and then ascending and descending stairs. How many times does a prosthetist try to fix a socket because the person's complaining of pain and they, when do you look at it? When they're standing. But the pain may be when they were sitting, but you asked them to stand up, they figured you know what you were talking about, and so you fixed it for standing, but they leave, and they still have pain when they, when they leave because they're um, having difficulty in sitting. When we look at the Trinity, I love the Trinity because it gives you information that you might not otherwise ask the patient. And I know this is small to uh, see. Uh, it's so small, I've got to even get close to it. But to say the question, um, I, have gotten, um, oh, I have gotten used to uh, wearing my prostheses. Now, when I ask that question, if the person says I disagree, Chances are, when they say they haven't gotten used to wearing your prosthesis, my follow-up question is, well, how often are you wearing your prosthesis? And when you get that long pause and that look down, and you remember they carried their prosthesis in a bag when they came into your facility, chances are they haven't gotten used to wearing it because they're not wearing it. But your assumption is, is they're wearing it all the time because I trained them how to use it. The next is when you ask somebody, is that it's a prosthesis interferes with my ability to do work? Is it the prosthesis or are they blaming the prosthesis? What did you do? Can I teach you how to do what you need to do at work so that you can feel more comfortable to go to work and you're not blaming the prosthesis because you're not working? I got that person back to work. We can get credit for that. The next is I'm having a prosthesis limits the amount of work that I can do. Well, I had a couple patients in the last year who were complaining of back pain. And they said, well, I, one person was a salesperson who drove a lot. The other person was a computer operator who sat in a chair a lot. And so I said, let me see how you're sitting. Well, when they sat, they sat in a slump position because of the, the, um, uh, the, the, not so much the prosthesis, because of their posture. When I turned around, gave them a simple towel to get their uh, posture better and get their pelvis in a better position, the pain went away. They were no longer complaining. But what did they blame for their inability to work? The prostheses. It's easy. Just blame the prostheses. We as physios, we do it all the time. Or we try to come up with ways to make it better. You can also look at the functional capabilities and the other about the tapes uh, is amazing because it asks about the appearance and the shape and the other things about the prostheses which are important. The prosthetic limb user survey developed by Brian Hafner gives you huge amounts of information and can tell you what percentage that patient is within the total population of those who are wearing a prosthesis. So you say, oh, you're in the top 10%. Well, now you can check it and say, well, actually you're in the top 36%, but you're doing well. More importantly, I can look at this, are you able to walk a short distance in your home? Well, that's looking at balance, endurance, walking ability, turns, vision, carpets, and pets. And so now I know how to go through that. Why aren't you walking as well as you want? You'd like to. I ask these questions. Is that what about balance, strength, endurance, and ability uh, uh, when you're looking at are you able to walk across a parking lot? Well, you add endurance to this. You also add the vestibular system. And do they have the confidence to walk around? So we can find specific skills that we can address if 
we ask the right questions. The ABC is full of really strong questions that can be uh, found as when you walk around the house, do you have difficulty or fear? And, or confidence is actually the question. Well, when you walk around the house, 70% of mobility entails a turn. So do I need to do turning training with that patient so that they feel more comfortable walking around the house? And that continues through all of these questions. And then you can do the amputee mobility predictor. We talked about that yesterday. And you got all of these things that you have exercises as you do in every one of these other instruments. The timed up and go is when the person stands. Is that, are they slow because they're getting out of the chair? Are they slow with initiating gait? Is the turn difficult for them? Or is it that final turn to get back into the chair? When we watch, we find things that we can work with. The L test is excellent because it adds another couple of turns, and as Bill Miller illustrated, is that it looks at a different dimension. The six-minute walk test is a gold standard. We can look at, at people in categories, or we can look at their endurance. When people speed up, they tend to alter the symmetry of their gait, and so are they getting so excited about trying to cover as much distance is that they're forgetting what you taught them. So then what we find is that don't overstep, but actually keep your legs underneath you and maintain symmetry because if they're doing it during the six minute walk test, you know they're doing it in the community, you know they're doing it when they're walking with a colleague, when they're walking down the hallway, and is that causing back pain, is that causing knee pain for that individual? And the same thing with the two minute test if you wanna save four minutes in the clinic. So what do you do with the tools? I venture to guess if you go into most prosthetic facilities, you have all your tools organized. You have to do them, or maybe not. It seems every time I go in there, somebody cleaned up. But anyway, is do you need to do that with your outcome measures? And it can be as simple as putting them in an Excel spreadsheet. But the trick is, it's not just doing the outcome measure when you first see the patient, when you deliver the prosthesis. What's your follow-up? What is the long-term effect? So did you do uh, uh, baseline, 30 days, 90 days, six months, and a year? And when did they reach the minimal detectable change where now you're starting to see at the ABC, they jump from one level to the other? And with most of these outcome measures, there are values that you can attached to that test that shows that you made a clinically significant difference to that patient. Do you have that in your notes? Because that becomes important. And the practice now, and these are standards for, um, and guidelines for demonstrating the value of rehab services that are being applied by what we call accountable care organizations, which is driving healthcare in the United States. And what they ask for is that you develop standards. So within your clinical practice, this is what we're going to do. Now that doesn't mean Fred does this, Nancy does that, and uh, Jose does something else. It means that everybody adheres to those standards. And you collect the outcome measures, and at the end of the year, you sit down as a team and you look at what are the differences that you are finding. And from that, you can basically begin to build your database. Now, here's the big obstacle. I'm sorry, this is nice. Thank you very much for uh, taking up our time with this keynote address to talk about this, but do you know how busy I am? I don't have time. We certainly don't have the staff or the resources. My patients are never going to do this, and what's the, what's the value anyway? Well, first of all, there's never been a more chock-a-box toolbox as we go around today looking at mobile devices, technologies, and being able to have better access to all of these measures. And if we look at the time, well the time if you do all of these tests, and I'm not saying these are the right tests to do, you have to make that call, is that the minimum amount of time is the patient is sitting in the, in the patient, well the, the time is the patient time is 23 minutes at minimum, your time as a clinician is 23 minutes. Maximum if you have an older person that has difficulty reading what have you, maybe a little bit more, 43 minutes. Your time if they're a little bit slower and you gotta go a little more gingerly, it's 30 minutes. But every other person Profession. We as therapists spend 45 minutes doing the initial evaluation, sometimes even longer than that. When can they do this? They're waiting for you. You're running behind. You've got 30 minutes that you're asking them to sit. Now they're getting angry at you. Why am I sitting here? They could be filling out these forms, giving you that data. Then you say, well, my patients don't want to fill this out. Now, physicians have said that for a long, long time. 
However, a study that was done by Zogby found that 75% of patients are more than willing to participate in outcome measures and to uh, participate in scientific research, especially if you tell them how well they're doing. We all want to know. I improved my time on my 5K. I've gotten uh, a, a higher evaluation from my boss. All of these things are good things. They want to see how they change, and they're going to love you for it. Then you, and here's the biggest issue. When you sit down with your patients, you're going to be able to have a meaningful conversation. I will tell you is that watching a number of my friends who are prostatists, the thing that I notice the most is you become device-focused. They come straight in. How you doing? Boom. Right down to the leg. And the value of this is, yes, you're committed to what you're doing. Also, your patients will be the first to know that you're going bald. But at the end of the day, they're there and you're just focused about this thing that's on, on your leg rather than spending the first 15 minutes saying, I see that you're having back pain. I see that you're having difficulty climbing stairs. I see that you are, uh, you're having difficulty with friends in accepting your prostheses. Ask those questions, it makes a huge difference. We do it all the time. And the number one thing people say, nobody in three years has asked me the questions that you've just asked me. And that makes a difference. So we look at the diagnosis. We look at the level of complexity. We look at the number of visits and we have the outcomes because we know we can decrease health care. What does that mean for your practice? Well, number one, your documentation is going to be a lot better. And you're now going to be able to use your documentation in ways you never dreamed. Secondly, in the United States, it's a big deal when you get audited. If you do get audited, you've got the data and they will leave you alone. Because I guarantee you, nobody else in the community will have this kind of data. And they just, uh, they, they're going for the low-hanging fruit. So if you have all of these numbers and you can justify what you're doing, they'll say thank you very much and they'll leave. Second of all, patient selection is we have this giant assumption that all patients are the same. And they're not. And now you can begin to look at... Who treats better transfemoral amputees, transtibia amputees, bilateral complex patients, patients with diabetes, trauma, those with HO, all of those things? When you get that data, that will help you make better financial decisions. And if you don't believe so, why are all the uh, hospitals looking at this data? They want to make financial decisions. Information is power. And getting that information is going to allow you to make better business decisions. It will also help you with staffing. Many folks think, oh, I need all these techs back here. Maybe you don't have the right people in the office. Maybe you need an outcomes administrator to help put all this together and that person is going to yield you more dollars than the guy who's back in, uh, uh, in the lab who's working with the plaster and building the prostheses. Then you're going to look at your components. Is that the average prosthetist in the United States only selects three prosthetic feet and it's usually because when he calls into the company he likes the voice of the operator on the other side. However, and if you practice for more than 20 years that drops to only two prosthetic feet that you use. And look at all the ones that are out there in the exhibit hall. So then you develop prof uh, professional partnerships. You refer back to the physician. You refer to the therapist, to the psychologist, to the endocrinologist, to the dietitian. And therefore, you're not just a one-way traffic where everything's coming to you. You're giving that information out, and you're also giving the information about the oswestry, about the, uh, or the knee pain, the back pain, the psychosocial commitment. And then nobody else is going to be able to market that like you can. So that's the difference. In the United States, we had a problem. In 2011, they came out with a study that said increased expenses for prosthetics went up 27%, yet the need for prosthetics decreased by 2.5%. They called prosthetists defrauders. They were people doing devious things to scam the country. So what happened is the process said, oh, it's unfair. Oh, I hope this goes away quickly. Many people, there was the highest point in history of selling practices and um, uh, acquirement by large companies. People want to say, well, let me figure out the minimum amount of uh, documents I need. And the worst thing to happen is people began to downgrade the prosthetic devices that they were using. There were too many microprocessors out there, they said. So what happened? K3 knees and K3 feet decreased once this uh, letter came out. What increased? K1, K2. And this is by the American Orthotic Prosthetic 
Association. So it basically, it said, hey, the government reviews were right. But why did they do this? Because it was a path of least resistance. Rather than saying, wait a second, you know what? There are big differences that are out there. But because they, they cowtail to it, is that folks, and this is happening, your patients will notice the difference. If I'm going to go to you and get a satch foot, because it's easy payment, where I could get a dynamic response foot from somebody else, they're going to say, hey, why are you still going to this guy? Go to this guy. Is that they could be increased secondary conditions because you're giving them the wrong appliance, uh, the wrong um, Prosthetic appliance. You're also changing the financial margins. You're not going to get the same reimbursement, so you're going to have to reduce your staff. Your time with your patients is going to be reduced because you're going to work harder, and this is going to continue to go on and on. Instead of saying, hey, before 2005, there weren't things as microprocessor knees, and there weren't things as microprocessor ankles. Ankles. Technology improved to improve the care of our patients. That's why the cost went up by 27%. It went down as far as the patients because there were better interventions to look over the foot. Is that the rehab for amputees have evolved in the United States. That's why the cost went up. Prior to 2005, only 15% of people who had limb amputation received rehabilitation care. Now it's up to 30%, and that's nothing to be really proud of. We'd like to make it a little bit higher, but that's where we're at. Clinicians, even at that time, were underprescribing. We have multiple um, small studies that have shown 30% of prosthetists were underprescribing, giving somebody a K2 foot when they could have given them a K3 foot. And as a result, is that with the, we find the amputees um, have done better because they were better preventative amputations. So does this apply only to the developed countries? Well, as we look at global health care, and this was an article published in Lancet, is that this is hard to read, but because of global technologies, we're seeing a grand convergence in health care is going to occur because of these health technologies. So the low-income uh, countries are going to decrease in terms of access to health care over the next few years. So things like the ICRC, this limb has taken care of so many people around the world. In fact, if you go on Red Cross website, is that 25 countries, since 1979, 25 countries have manufactured more than 180,000 artificial limbs for 160,000 amputees and that the average length of wear is three to five years. Well, wait a second. 180,000 by 60. So only 20,000 people got a second limb? So are they not working? Where are the numbers? We don't have the follow-up numbers. But, and our newer technologies may be more appropriate as we start moving forward. But we find is that a study that was done by Brakel and Postima shows that the satisfaction with the ICI RC limbs are high and that they do wear them for a long period of time and there is reduced pain and there is a good socket fit. However, we need more data than just simply saying is that they wear it, there's no pain, and that they thought that the fit was better. So going back to where we started is that we're moving from just clinical trials to everything that you do can contribute to what the level, the comparative effectiveness of what you do with your patients. What we really have to do is start looking at how do we start working with this globally so that we share between continents, between countries, because our observations make a difference and we need to start creating registries. When we look at the countries that are involved in looking at the uh, R&D, for gross expenditures per percentage of our GDP, we see that Switzerland, Iceland are the key leaders as well as Denmark and the USA does break the top five along with Sweden, UK and others. But the key to this graph is the blue is private business. Private business is dry and that doesn't mean manufacturers, that means clinics, hospitals and other invested uh, 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 entities in this or stakeholders in this are, are contributing to the research that's driving how healthcare is provided. We need to do the same as a profession. The red is the government agencies, that's minimal. So you need to look at your diagnosis, the level of complexity, the number of visits, the outcomes that you use, and looking at your patient satisfaction. Because at the end of the day, is that the information is power. And if you collect the data, 
you do the analytics on the data, you then share the data with those that are the decision makers, is then you're going to have the right analytics you're going to find is going to be gold and pay off with your patience, with your practice, and also with your reimbursement. Because comparative effectiveness research is a golden opportunity to know who are the patients that are going to have the greatest change, what are the interventions associated with the greatest change within your practice, when is an intervention associated with the greatest change. In other words, it's not early on. We see some of the biggest changes happening at nine months to a year out after amputation because so many other things have cleared. Where is the best delivery? Is it in hospital? Is it in rehab center? Is it in the home? And how much? What is the cost of effectiveness for all of this? So, in conclusion, only you can Im uh, improve your patient's quality of life. Only you can demonstrate the value of your intervention. Nobody else is going to come in and do it for you. Only you can change your payer's thinking. Only you can grow your own practice. Only you can advance our profession. Because it is you that looks into a mother's eye who's sitting there with her child who may have been born without a limb or had some kind of accident and tell mom, it's going to be okay. He's, I'm going to take care of him. He's going to live a healthy and normal life. It is you that looks into the eye of a mother and a wife who lost her limb in a traffic accident and you say, it's going to be okay. You're going to be back to work. You're going to uh, enjoy all those moments with your family. I'm going to make it right. And it's only you that can look into an elder couple's years and say, you're going to enjoy the golden years together. You're going to travel. You're going to dance together. You're going to watch your daughter go down the aisle at her wedding. I'll get you up. We'll get you walking. And at the end of the day, it's only you that can control your own future. And I've never been prouder to be a part of this profession, working legally together with everyone that is here. And I hope that our future is bright. And with that, I thank you, I thank ISPO, and I thank OSER for sponsoring the keynote address. Thank you very, very much.